We got Gators Breakdown here. We know we're business. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters. You can find me on social media at GatorDave underscore SEC. Joining me on this episode of Gators Breakdown, co-host Will Miles. You can find him at readreaction.com. Read and Reaction on YouTube as well as we are hitting July. And we're getting to this episode a little bit later than we normally have uh, in the summertime. And just vacations going on will's got baseball going on with with with, with uh, his family there and hey just a lot of stuff recruiting has been kind of going on there and the preseason magazine's been pushed back a little bit because of i'm assuming you know second wave of transfer portal so they want to have as much as they can uh getting in there so will man thanks for hopping on and uh here we go with uh billy napier's third year uh and preseason magazines you know of well we'll get into it but uh do or die year, one anonymous SEC coach says for Billy Napier. We'll certainly get into that, but uh, another uh, another chance to talk about these Gators in this format of a national narrative. Yeah, it's funny. You're talking about them waiting for the second wave of the transfer portal and that sort of stuff for the previews. It's something we considered when we when we decided to put out our preseason magazine and then looked at it, looked at the numbers and said, eh, it's not going to have a whole lot to do with who wins, so we may as well go ahead and put it out now. And, and uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where we all like talking about the transfers. We all like talking about plugging those holes. But if by the time July comes around, you're still plugging holes, or even by the end of May comes around, you're still plugging holes, you're probably in trouble. And so Florida, I think, plugged a couple there, and maybe that's a good a good sign. But, uh, um, you know, the, the, the bones of this season – have all been established over the last couple of years. And I think you read any of these preseason magazines, that's what you're going to find. It's going to be a discussion about the bones of the house. And then, hey, we might talk about the trim a little bit, but you know, nobody really cares about the trim if the whole place is on fire. So that's sort of what we're trying to figure out when we're looking at some of these programs here during the offseason. Yeah, and I think it was kind of pretty unique to Florida too to get somebody like Elijah Badger's status for that you know wide receiver spot that so desperately needed. Uh, yeah, I think for the most part you could probably still go with the same schedule you've always gone with, with these preseason magazines and be and be pretty okay uh, with, with with what you put out there. But Elijah Badger certainly uh, a big part of this uh, Gator team, and we'll see it this fall. But hey, plenty to get into. As I said, I think you know big picture wise, what you get from these preseason magazines and what they have to say. Um, it, it gives us a pretty good indication, gives us a pretty good preview of, and, and at least their thoughts of, you know, as I said, a national narrative of what Florida will be, won't be, can be, maybe not be, maybe surprise. We'll get into all that right here on this episode of Gators Breakdown. So hit that like button, subscribe right here on this uh, episode of Gators Breakdown, subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on your Podcast platform, if you haven't done so yet, keep the conversation going, of course, at Gators Breakdown Plus. Your link is in the description to join there. Have some good discussion right there on the uh, Discord server. Uh, certainly, we're recruiting going on right now, and your thoughts on these preseason magazines. So, Will, let's get into it right here. Athlon has the Gators 35th overall. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, if you want to go by a top 25, 10 spots out of that top 25, uh, a predicted finish. I mean, here's the crazy thing, Will. 11th in the SEC, but 35th overall. <laughs> this is how the SEC works. We know that. Uh, while Lindy's ranks the Gators very similarly, not not uh, too big of a gap difference here. Lindy's ranks the Gators 37th overall compared to Athlon's 35th, and one spot lower in the SEC at 12th. Uh, Lindy's does go on to say, explain in their ranking, quote, the nation's toughest schedule, bad portal losses, circling the drain is what Lindy's has to say for Florida uh, in their ranking. So Florida is grouped in that group of Texas A&M, Auburn, Kentucky. They're all kind of grouped together in these rankings. And look, and I think it can be argued Florida has a better quarterback situation than those squads. You play both Texas A&M and Kentucky, so you certainly have a, a, you know, a, a pathway to either – meet that expectation, overcome the expectation, or not meet that expectation at all, you know, but certainly the harder schedule out of them all. I personally probably would have Florida power rated ahead of all of them except Texas A&M because of Florida's quarterback situation. I, I go back and forth on Florida, Texas A&M uh, a bit, but, you know, if so, that would put Florida at nine uh, of a power rating, which I'd have no issue with. Uh, but you know, as a power rating heading into the season, I really don't think there's a way you can have Florida higher than that. 
if you want to predict it, then go for it. But you know, I think it's a different conversation when you're talking about a power rating, what we've seen the first two years of Billy Napier, comparing it to where Texas A&M is, even with the new head coach, Kentucky, and what they've done to Florida the last few years, Auburn and Hugh Freeze. That group right there, I think, is pretty right. And look, yeah, I discussed it with Braden Gall of Athlon a couple of weeks ago. Like, you can just jumble these teams up, and whatever spits it out, you probably can be pretty okay with. Yeah, I mean, that's really what you've seen in the SEC over the past three or four years. You know, typically any four-year period, if you take the recruiting rankings, you can look at their four-year win-loss record, and it ends up tracking pretty well. But individually, in a year-to-year basis, you don't necessarily see that. You see a lot of noise in the data where, hey, Missouri has a really good season in 2023. Do we expect them to come back to the pack? Kentucky had a really good season a couple of years ago. I think it was 2021. And they've sort of come back to the pack. That's what you see in that middle of the pack. And that's sort of where Florida is. That's where Texas A&M is, though A&M has recruited a little bit better. Obviously lost a lot more in the transfer portal. I think the big thing this year when you start talking about power rankings in the SEC, you know, you, you were sort of laughing earlier when you said 35th in the country. Country, but 11th overall in the SEC. Well, this is where the addition of Texas and Oklahoma yeah. really makes a difference, right? Not only does Florida have that game with Texas, but everybody in the conference is going to be going to be beating each other up. And typically what we find is sort of the cream rises to the top, that the top two or three recruiting teams in the SEC consistently finish up there. And then anywhere from three to nine, sort of, you know, one team might really rise up one year and one team might really fall. It's hard to predict which one is which. So like you said, if you're really bullish on the Gators, if you really think Graham Mertz is ready to take the next step forward, if you love Elijah Badger and, and Trey Wilson at wide receiver, if you think the addition of Ron Roberts is going to make them much, much better on the defensive side of the ball, then you say, hey, Florida is that team that conceivably could take that jump. But I, but you're sort of guessing at this point, right? I mm-hmm. mean, if you guess Auburn, you're you're banking on Hugh Freeze being able to fix that offense. If you're t- if you're taking a team like Missouri to drop, hey, you're doing that based on you feel like they overplayed sort of what their their numbers and expectations last year were. Old Miss has rated the transfer portal, but 11 wins last year. How often does Mississippi win 11 straight or win 11 games two years straight? Very rarely. So you know, you start looking at these teams that Florida's jumbled up with, and you can start to you can start to figure out where they might be. Like you said, sort of in that Texas A&M area. I think Florida's pretty close to the Texas and Oklahoma space overall as a program. The question is, do they have the quarterback to drive forward to where they need to be um, as those two enter the conference? You know, I, I have my doubts about Graham Mertz. Nobody who's listened to us would be all that surprised about that. But uh, but look, I think Florida's going to be a pretty good team this year. The question will be, you know, The question will be one health, right? I mean, when you get to this point, I think depth and health really starts to play an issue for these inner, for these sort of anywhere between 20 to 35 in the SEC. Depth and health really plays a major role. And then the other part is, is just who sort of has the schedule luck, like who gets Vanderbilt, South Carolina, Mississippi State, and Arkansas versus who gets Georgia, Alabama, Texas, and Texas A&M. That sort of determines where, yeah, we see this in the NFL all the time, yeah. where you see a team that gets a last place schedule and you'll, you'll, the over under in Vegas moves by two wins because they end up with a last place schedule. If they have a first place schedule, hey, that brings them back to the pack. In some ways, that's one of the ways I think we might need to start thinking about the SEC is not just how good are you, not just what kind of players have you recruited not just what have you added in the portal but also who do you have to play because the reality is if we're ranking teams based on record the way they have in college football over the years well yeah Florida's going to lose a couple more games than a team that plays a significantly easier schedule which you know again I've had multiple discussions with Nick Knudsen about this on on our podcast where we're talking about um you know really eight and four this year for Florida I think you and I talked about it a month ago too eight and four for Florida College football is going to have to reward that. Otherwise, the non-conference schedules are going to go away. And so I'm I'm really curious to see how a team like Florida, if they do have a good season, is either rewarded or penalized. Because I look at it and go, Florida goes eight and four, and somebody with a much easier schedule goes nine and three or ten and two. Florida should be ranked higher than them irrespective of, hey, they lost a couple more games. So obviously in these magazines, they're talking about, I think, sort of the old college way of of evaluating teams, because otherwise I don't think you have Florida at 35 behind some of these teams. Um, you just sort Like you said, Athlon specifically talks about it being the schedule. And yeah. in, in that case, they're using the old way of ranking. And I, I think college football is going to move away from that as we move into this new playoff era. And if I'm not mistaken, I think v- Florida's Vegas over under, kind of going to your point, is five and a half, if 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 I remember right. So yeah, five and a half. Give Florida Missouri schedule kind of going to your point. 
There is no way Florida's over under is not seven and a half. Even with the bad couple of seasons Florida just had, I could not fathom if Florida didn't have at least seven and a half given Missouri's schedule. Uh, so it's, it, that does let you know that the schedule imbalance and what the you know the SEC kind of hit. Uh, planned it that way if you were a traditional power you were going to kind of get that tougher schedule you were going to play if you especially for florida you're going to play georgia you're going to play tennessee you're going to play lsu if you're missouri if you're mississippi state if you're old miss if you're vanderbilt if you're kind of you know if you split the sec in half and you put it into two tiers they kind of kept it that way you know your big traditional your money spenders they were all kind of grouped together and then all the other teams were stacked under that and they're all kind of playing each other that's the way it kind of broke out with the schedule this year and like i said you know teams in college football and i know josh pate says this a whole lot you you're really not what your record says it is you know if you look at florida's schedule compared to a lot of other people that's not really the case this year uh so that is a good point and you know i think if you power rank florida yeah you can certainly put them as high as ninth but you as you start looking at it and you get a predicted order of finish you can certainly see why florida would be a 10 11 12. Well, I mean, so what? You mean Murray State, Buffalo, Boston College, Vanderbilt, Texas A&M, and UMass to start the season is isn't like getting you getting you excited for Missouri football? I, exactly. I, uh, yeah. And that's, so, and that's not to take away from Missouri. I think that they could be a really good team, but man, like I'd be disappointed if I'm a Missouri fan and I do not make the college football playoff with that schedule. Well, maybe I, I think I think the same thing you could say about Ole Miss, right? Ole Miss has yes. a little bit more difficult schedule, but the expectations there are higher. And and you know, Nick and I have been talking all off season about this is a powder keg ready to happen with all these personalities brought into one room who haven't grown together as a team. And Billy Napier sort of done the opposite. What I will say about the power ranking, and I think it's legitimate in this in this stance. And if you asked me to rank where Florida would be, I'd probably have them in that twenty seven to thirty. 37 range anyway right yeah i don't think 35 is like a bad ranking no, for Florida absolutely is. Not. yeah but i'll but i'll tell you where that ranking comes from for me where it comes from for me is that billy napier has not proven in the two years he's been at florida that he is a difference maker at head coach that mm-hmm. he's going to take a team that hey we're going on the road against a team where we're overmatched and we're going to keep it close and maybe we'll pull one out at the end or hey we're going to go into a we're going to have a team coming into the swamp and we're going to be prepared to jump on them to a point where it's 21 to nothing after the first quarter and hey maybe you got to hold on for dear life coming down the fourth quarter maybe you got to do a few things you know non-conventionally in order to get that win maybe you need a defense that can, that can actually get a stop and cause a turnover like or maybe you need a special teams unit that just makes a difference you think about missouri's season last year the whole thing sort of hinged or at least really started to shift on the field goal kick against kansas state that gives them a win i think it was what over 50 yards yeah the guy makes a game-winning field goal against kansas state and we're sitting there going oh that's kind of a cool win over a kansas state team that's sort of eh. and then it turns out that kansas state team was better than we thought turns out missouri was better than we thought but really the special teams play i mean if the guy yanks the field goal left or if or if the the field goal unit runs onto the team when it's not onto the field when it's not supposed to <laughs> and they have a five yard penalty you know we're not talking about missouri as a team that has any shot at getting to the college football playoff we're talking about oh they had a year where they went nine and three or eight and four and isn't that nice for those guys at missouri to actually have a winning season like that's what we're talking about so to me that's the thing is the differentiator when it comes to napier he needs like you know you talked about do or die labeling it that way to me, it's the operational excellence. It's the it's the stuff that we were sold when he came in that, hey, is he going to be the absolute best recruiter in the SEC? I think Kirby Smart around. That's a, that's a really tough ask. But is he going to do everything operationally well so that he can compete as best he can in that forum? That was the expectation. In recruiting, on the field, special teams, defense, certainly. Uh, maybe even on offense, you could make some arguments there. We haven't seen that yet. And until we start to see that, I think you're basically going to look at it and go, all right, how does how do Florida's players compare to everyone else's? There's no net gain or loss because of the head coach or the coaching staff. And so that's where they sit, somewhere in that you know 27 to 37 range. All right, we'll continue on the coverage here. We will get into the anonymous coaches here in just a bit. Uh, but I will go to Lindy's and, and, and turn it to theirs. They have a SEC um, focus magazine. Athlon doesn't do the SEC focus magazine anymore, unfortunately. I reached, I reached out to Braden today. I was like, 
Is that thing coming out? He's like, I, I don't think we're doing it anymore. So Athlon's website does go into more stuff, and I'll go into that in just a second. But Lindy's preseason magazine still does have their SEC version. So I will dive into theirs. Will, players to watch. Quarterback Graham Mertz, running back Montreal Johnson, wide receiver Eugene Wilson. Uh, this was before, as I said, Elijah Badger transfers as well. I would put him on that players to watch list as well. i go switch over to defense. Defensive tackle Cam Jackson, linebacker Shamar James. One transfer will they do have as a player to watch. Linebacker Grayson Howard is added to that players to watch as well. Uh, and cornerback Jason Marshall. Um, surprise under the safety transfers were added to that players to watch. But uh, as we go, you know, this is why we go through this thing. Uh, primary strength for the Gators, Lindy says. Florida would feature a balanced offense with Mertz leading the passing game and Johnson running the football. More speed, length, and depth should result in more big plays on both sides of the ball. Potential problems. Florida lost his top receiver, Ricky Pearsall, to the NFL. Both his top rusher, or pass rusher, Prince Eumann Mielin, and main big play threat, Trevor Etienne, to the transfer portal. That production is hard to replace. Depth at receiver remains a concern. As I said, I still think it is a concern, but definitely alleviated a bit more with Elijah Badger coming in. As I said, preseason magazines before that uh, had come in. Key losses, running back Trevor Etienne, Ricky Pearsall, Prince of Human Mielin. Uh, they're stretching a bit here, Will. Jalen Kimber is a uh, key loss, uh, according to Lindy's here. Uh, and I will agree with this one a little bit. Jaden Hill uh, in, in the backfield. Overview. Florida is getting deeper and more experienced, but will it result in more wins against such a daunting schedule? The Gators may need to decide whether to turn the keys of an offense over to DJ Lagway if they struggle out of the gate to continue to build for the future. Florida also must show it can play with more physicality on both lines of scrimmage against SEC opponents. Certainly agree with that last part there. Will, this one's interesting. Key number, 31. Number of points the Gators were outscored by in the second half during their season-ending five-game losing streak. Florida needs to learn to sustain energy and execution for full four quarters to have more success this season. So that goes to a lot of point where the fan base will bring up, hey, Florida was in this game. Florida was in that game. We only lost by this much. And you know, we, we're in control against Missouri, in control versus Florida State. Um, if you know LSU game, and if a couple things break your way, you probably be, you could win that game as well. Arkansas, of course, you know, just the falling apart late in that game and just not doing anything in overtime of that game. Uh, you know, there were a lot of chances late, but you were outscored, as they say, 31 points. The Gators were outscored by in the second half during their season ending five game losing streak. Uh, but going back to that overview, Will, the Gators may need to decide whether to turn the keys of the offense over to DJ Lagway if they struggle out of the gate. If Florida struggles out of the gate, okay, you might turn the keys over to DJ Lagway, but ultimately, what would it mean? Because does, does Billy Napier survive a struggle out of the gate? I think that's a certainly a valid question with where Florida's at. But you know, for players to watch, primary strengths, potential problems, and overview that thirty-one number at the end of, in, in the season. Pretty good overlook there from Lindy's. Can agree with some of it. Can certainly disagree with some of it. Yeah, I'm a little bit surprised that they don't have Brandon Cren Crenshaw Dixon and Devon Manuel as players to watch on the offensive side of the ball. They if, do. If, okay, uh, before okay, I don't want to. I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, Gators recruiting. Three newcomers of impact. I've already looked at this. They do mention Brendan Crenshaw Dixon as a newcomer of impact. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's be honest. To me, those are the two most important guys that have been added to the roster this offseason. You've got guys who are proven offensive linemen at the college football level, proven tackles at the offense at at, at the at the major college football level. And you're adding them to Austin Barber. So now you have three tackles that allows you to move George inside. It allows you to maybe put a guy like Najee Harris at the other guard, or, or you know whatever they decide to do at the other guard position. Uh, basically, you're not you're not searching to, to just fill holes. You've brought yeah. in tackles to take those positions. And if you think about how Billy Napier's offense works, the whole thing is predicated on a zone blocking scheme that frees up play action pass. And a lot of the sacks last year, if you go back and look at the film, there are probably three or four times where Florida had Mertz turn his back to the defense, 
try to execute a play action pass where he comes out on a boot and then he's just hit like the mm-hmm. minute he turns around, doesn't even have time to look downfield. And that was a consistent theme last year. If you go back and look at the Utah game, I specifically remember one there where he sort of slipped as he hit, hit his last step in the drop because he was trying to avoid a rush before he even got to get his head around that sort of stuff should be gone. And the defense should have to respect the run considerably more with Crenshaw Dixon and Manuel in there. Now, you know, all that is predicated on being healthy, but that's one of the benefits of bringing in two guys to Austin Barber. You can probably sustain one injury there at the tackle position and still be somewhat okay throughout the year, which is going to probably be a really important thing for Florida because I think they're going to have to establish the running game with Montreal Johnson specifically. Now, what you said about DJ Lagway, I think the reality is, is if you look at the 2011 season with Dan Mullen, if he had given Anthony Richardson more run when 20, things started going 2021. 2021. Yeah. He's at 2011. 2011. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting old. So 2021, if you look at Dan Mullen, if he had given Anthony Richardson more run, I think there would have been more patience. Mm. I think. Um, no, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I do agree with that. So I don't know that to be sure, but I think there would have been more patience because even if Richardson had failed, it would have been one of those things where at least we know what we've got. And I know you and I were talking about that. I know lots of other people were talking about that. At least we know what we've got. And and to me, that's the thing. So, I, you know, look, people have asked me all offseason, do I think Napier is gone? Or what does Billy Napier need to do in order to stay? And the answer isn't a certain number of wins because he's got conceivably an elite signal caller waiting in the wings. And so to me, it's you got to sell hope for the program. So if they just like fall apart and they're losing by 25 points a game in the first four games of the year. Yeah. Okay. Nobody can justify that. But if you have a couple of, if you have a close loss on the road to Tennessee, if you, if you squeak one out against Kentucky and then you get pounded by, by Georgia and and Texas, and then you say, okay, it's time to switch to Lagway and Lagway lights it up and you end up barely making a bowl, but Lagways look fantastic. I think the season, like the way we feel about the season feels completely different than the way we felt coming out of the 2023 season where it was that loss to Arkansas cost us a shot at a bowl game, a lot of mismanagement, you know, oh my God, the recruiting class is falling apart as we're doing, you know, all those different things sort of conflated to, to make the feeling this off season be one of sort of dread of what's coming. Now, look, that may still be what occurs, but, but I think, you know, I talk about this all the time for college football, you sell wins and you sell hope. And so the switch to lagway is about hope. And now if lagway falls on his face or if Napier, sort of gets in the way of lagway winning, like you put him in there and then you're ultra conservative. So you really can't see what he can do and those sorts of things. Then yeah, I think it's going to be tough, but you know, I also don't anticipate Florida schedule sets up for them to at least be competitive early on in the season. Mm-hmm. So I don't think you're going to be making determinations at the quarterback position or at the head coach position early on in the season. I think you're probably going to be making those determinations in the last five games of the season, which to be honest is where we evaluated last season too. If Florida had gone three and two in those last five games last year, we would be a lot more enthusiastic about what's coming in 2024 Instead, they go 0 and 5, and we basically had from Thanksgiving until August of the next year to talk about what's going on with the program. And, and that's just sort of the reality. So, you know, that obviously it's not rocket science to say the Georgia, Texas, LSU, Ole Miss, FSU span will determine that. But I think I, I would I would be very, very surprised if Florida came slow out of the gate which um, you know is, is what they're assuming when they're talking about yeah. having to switch over to Lagway or Napier being in trouble early on. So on that point, um, most valuable player, they do put that on Graham Mertz. Uh, Florida will go as far as Mertz will take them. More is expected after Mertz, after passing for 2,900 yards, 20 touchdowns to just three interceptions. He led the SEC in completion percentage after transferring from Wisconsin. Helped bring in former Wisconsin teammate Shimmery DK. Uh, who connected with 47 times with in 2022, will also serve as a mentor to five-star freshman quarterback DJ Lagway. Then they have a player profile on Graham Mertz where they talk about you know expanding the passing game, getting involved more down the field. Will the emerging star, this one I kind of question because I think he's kind of already broken out of that mold, but maybe on a national level, maybe not. Certainly in Gator Nation he has, but they have the emerging star as Eugene Wilson. 
I'm like, eh, you know, for a Florida fan, I think we already think he's emerged. He's already <laughs> he's already did that. So, uh, okay, uh, from a national narrative, I can completely understand it. Uh, Trey had a team high six touchdown catches while finishing second on the team in receptions with 61 and receiving yards with 538. Don't be surprised to see him return punts or kickoffs on jet sweeps to take advantage of his blazing speed and playmaking ability. After averaging only 8.8 yards of response, per reception last year figures to be more of a downfield threat in 2024. Uh, with that also, I go back to what Billy Napier was telling us on his spring speaking tour. We're going to wear him out. <laughs> so that is welcome. Uh, uh, and like, I don't think he was joking. I mean, that was a welcome, uh, you know, you can't take, you know, a lot of those things. I think, uh, I, I think you can take that one at face value. <laughs> when Billy Napier is saying that, uh, because I think he knows what he has uh, in Trey Wilson. And then top newcomer, we'll go back one more time, linebacker Grayson Howard. They have as the top newcomer for, uh, for the Gators. Six foot four, 235 pounds, brings size and physicality to the Florida linebacking core that has been lacking in recent seasons. Expect Howard, a South Carolina transfer, to start alongside Shamar James and immediately make an impact on the Florida defense. As a true freshman last year, 19 tackles, a tackle for loss, forced fumble uh, for the Gamecocks. So uh, I do think, um, Will, I, I probably would. It, look, everybody knows how much of a Grayson Howard homer 904 I am. Uh, but I probably would have went safety. Or no, no, I won't say I would have went safety. I think you could have went safety. But at the same time, with Jordan Castell as a returning player in that secondary, I do I do think he's going to be a huge factor. Asa Turner coming in, DJ Douglas coming in, Triquist Bridges coming in. Uh, but I do think Castell will still have a major force back there on that back end. I have no issue, and I can kind of agree with right here, putting Grayson Howard, because as that little blurb said, we've seen the struggles at Florida at the linebacker spot. Shamar James hopefully stays healthy. I think we want to see more from him too, but – we have missed that true linebacker presence. You've tried to pitch and hold players. You've had Amari Bernie. You've had Scooby Williams the last couple of years. Guys that not weren't necessarily your true linebackers had done some good things at that spot, but you still lack that true linebacker presence. The instincts, the 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 the, the tackling, the attacking the hole. Hopefully, Gr- Grayson Howard does bring that in that presence. But Graham Mertz, most valuable player, emerging star Trey Wilson, top newcomer Grayson Howard. Hard to disagree with any of that. I know we'll kind of get into some of that emerging star stuff when we really do our preseason look right before the season. Uh, but the way Lindy's explains it, you can certainly see there. But I don't know if we'd have Trey as a, an emerging star. He's already been that to us. No, I, I think, you know, we looked at that and said, get him the ball about three, ga- <laughs> three games in last year. And we're thrilled when they decided to do it against South Carolina and Georgia. And honestly, that's when the offense really started to take off. Um, losing Pearsall clearly is going to impact the team. I don't think I don't think it's rocket science to say that. At the same time, I'd be really surprised if Trey Wilson spends a lot of time outside. They'll go downfield a little bit more often to him, but I think that's one of the real benefits of bringing in Elijah Badger is that you that allows you to use Trey Wilson more as a Swiss Army knife. Now, obviously, they didn't know that at the time of the publication. Um, you know, from an emerging star perspective, it has to be somebody on the defense. Like, mm-hmm. we, can, we can talk about Trey Wilson or, or you know, somebody like Kanan Dan Daniels or something like that, stepping up at the running back position. But the reality is, is that Florida's defense has been so putrid that they need somebody to emerge. The guy I'd probably look at is Devin Moore. Really struggled to stay healthy at cornerback, but when he has been, he's been excellent. And if they can get a solid season out of Jason Marshall, and if they can get the kind of season out of Devin Moore that I think he's capable of if he can stay healthy, well, all of a sudden Florida's defense takes a big jump, and a lot of the offensive questions become moot because Florida's actually able to get a stop. Right. I mean, just to have a guy who can play man to man defense out there and doesn't get burned. I mean, I was there for the Florida State game and more played in that game. I think it might have been the first game he played in a while. And it just looked completely different. Look, Rotomaker for for FSU wasn't very good, but but he was he was on the wide receivers like glue. And so I sort of look at, you know, that's somebody that if you haven't watched Florida very much, if you haven't really looked at the roster, you go, oh, there's this guy who can't stay healthy, plays a few games a year, you know, blah, blah, blah. But you start looking at the deeper, like the PFF rankings, the on-off rankings, all that sort of stuff, and more is the guy that I'd really be looking at as as the emerging star. Hopefully he can fulfill that because I think it's going to be critical to what they're trying to do on defense. 
Yeah, uh, certainly. I, I certainly agree with you there. You, you'd love for that um, that newcomer to be on, the, whether it is Grayson Howe, whether it be Devin Moore in some form of <laughs> Who fashion. cares? Just going to stop. <laughs> yeah, you'd love for it to be somebody on that defensive side of the football uh, to, 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 to bring that. I know from when we go back to the spring game, you might want to go to a true freshman. You might, might want to put a Kenyon Daniels, a Jaden Ball uh, in, in that category too. I, yeah, I don't think from a Gator perspective we put Trey – Wilson in that from a national perspective, maybe so out uh, there. So, all right, Will, we'll go to a, one of my favorite parts of this, the anonymous coaches section. I know we love to break down and uh, what these coaches have to say. And here we go. Let's start with the Athlon side of things. I did kind of put this out there a couple of weeks ago when Braden Gall was on the episode, uh, but here it is. I mean, an opposing SEC coach out there says it is do or die time. I think a lot of coaches respect how Billy Napier has gone about his business, but there's a level of expectations in the SEC, and you have to build your plans around that accelerated pace. The coaching staff is almost totally different, especially on defense. That's the biggest problem we've heard about, that the internal system isn't right there. Keep it on going here. The roster would be the best they've had. There was a pretty significant drop in the talent at the end of the damn Mullen years, but that excuse has run out. Keep your own one. One more says quarterback Graham Mertz coming back might save Billy's job. And to end it right here, the schedule is brutal for them, but they should be able to find a way to a bowl. Um, Will, I think for here, uh, I completely agree. It is do or die time. I don't know what that means for you know Billy Napier and if this is a do or die, you know, if fired or whatever. I, I know some on the outside will think that. Some on the inside, the administration, the leash is probably a little bit longer. Um, that part where I think a lot of coaches respect how Billy Napier has gone about his business, I want to remember that for when we go to the Lindy's thing because that's there's a little bit of conflict there uh, in, in that thought. But, look, it's certainly – it is year three. This last part here. You have to build your plans around that accelerated pace. Yeah, I mean, look, that's what we've been talking about for years now. Every time Florida's gotten a new head coach every four, three or four years, is it 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 doesn't take very long for these coaches to show that they're going to win. And that's the concerning part about Napier. I will say that when Urban Meyer was in charge, these Athlon opposing coaches' views were a lot more negative. Like, so it, it turns out there's always those qualifiers when you got a guy who's, yeah. who's leading a losing program, right? So, hey, we respect how Napier's doing it. Hey, there's been a lot of turnover on, on the defensive staff. Not a lot of talent's been there. You know, Mertz really, really showed out. I mean, last year, like, the schedule's going to be all – there's a lot of qualifiers in here that you wouldn't necessarily hear if people were talking about anybody other than Alabama, right? Alabama, uh, Saban had built enough uh, – enough, uh, Cache. Cache. That's the great <laughs> word. He built enough cache that, that that opposing coaches really didn't take those shots. But you, you heard that when Florida was better. In fact, even when Dan Mullen was winning, you heard a lot of that. Now, some of that was because of the way Mullen rubbed some people. But um, but I do wonder, and, and we'll see. I, I actually haven't seen what the coaches and the Lindys have said. So he said there's some conflict there. So I'm a little bit curious to see that. But um, you know, I, the qualifiers here interest me because essentially it's coaches from the opposing team going, eh, maybe we can keep them around for another year. Like that might not be so bad. <laughs> um, on that defense part, it, it, it is true. Like when you go back and look at Corey Raymond and Sean Spencer and that change there, you know, what was coming out after that was it just did not mesh well with what was going on, you know, and I think that could, you know, some people will label that as an easy way out, you know, and look, look the defense was terrible. Uh, you, no matter what changes were made, you bring in Ron Roberts, you make all other kind of changes uh, on the defensive side of the ball. But the word was, you know, Corey Raymond, Sean Smith, for whatever reason, would not mesh in well with Austin Armstrong, which you had Patrick Tony before that as well. So There's been a lot of turnover on that side of the ball since Billy Napier has taken over. Yeah, I mean, and and that's where the fundamental question comes from, right? Is is that is that just a couple of bad hires, or is that fundamentally on Napier? And and I think it's also reasonable to say is making bad hires or or coaches who can't get along or can't be um, aligned is that really the head coach's job to get everybody in a room and make sure everybody is aligned? The problem is is that it's too late if you're doing it in week five. 
right? I mean, you really need everybody aligned coming out of spring practice, certainly coming out of fall practice. And, you know, we heard a lot of good things about the defense and a lot of what they, a lot of what I think people thought was going to happen against Utah. And then it just all fell apart there in week one. And sometimes you don't find out until you get punched in the mouth. And I think that's maybe, you know, every, everything was copacetic until there were a couple of times where they got laid out on the canvas. And then all of a sudden the infighting and, and the lack of alignment was probably pretty obvious. So hopefully that's what they've got at this point. But that sort of goes back to that first point that you talked about, that there's an accelerated pace in the, AC, in the SEC. You don't have you don't have three years to figure out your staff and make sure everybody's aligned. You might get that at a place like Louisiana. You don't get that at a place like Florida, at a place like LSU, at a place like Alabama, at a place like Georgia. You just don't. And so, um, you know, yeah, it's true, but it can be true. And it can also be Napier's fault all at the same time. And, Correct. and I think that's where most people sort of sit at this point is the excuses are over. I think that it's do or die time that you've got up there is the first thing is absolutely true. The excuses are done. It's now, I think 85% of this roster is Billy Napier's guys. The guys who are starting are going to be people Napier's brought in. The quarterback is somebody that he identified in the transfer portal and brought in. The best wide receiver is somebody that he recruited. The offensive line are either transfers he's brought in or people he's recruited. And, you know, the defense now, <laughs> he's on his third defensive coordinator who's been in. Obviously, Armstrong's still around, but you've got now had three different defensive coordinators who come in. Mm -hmm. At what point do we sit there and say, if there's an organizational problem, that organizational problem is not the defensive coordinator, is not the players, is not the schedule, is not the quarterback. That organizational problem is the guy who heads up the organization. I think they're right when they say that this is the year we're going to find out. Exactly. Right. I said, you know, the roster would be the best they've had. There was a pretty significant drop in the talent at the end of Dan Mullen years, but that excuse has run out. Absolutely agree with that. Uh, all right, let's go to the other side. Lindy's and the coaches they got a hold of for their opposing coach's view. Billy Napier got his butt handed to him in recruiting this year. He got poached at the end. I think Billy is really smart and a good coach. But here we go, Will. But I think he's too nice for that place. I don't think he has control of the players. You need a Nick Saban enema at Florida. Billy is not a huge disciplinarian. That's what happened with Will Muschamp and Jim McElwain, and Dan Mullen. Florida has been mismanaged by every head coach they've had since Urban Meyer. Another one goes on to say, Kirby Smart at Georgia built a championship-level defense first. Well, no, duh, he's a defensive head coach, but okay. <laughs> Alabama built a championship-level defense under Saban. Well, duh, he's a defensive head coach. Okay, <laughs> you've got to get that defense right. Billy Napier hasn't played Florida Gator defense. Okay, I agree with that part too, but of course Kirby Smart and Nick Saban are going to have that defense figured out first. Uh, okay, whatever. Um, and then the last part here, Florida opens with Miami and Gainesville. If the Gators don't win that game. Napier might not make it to October. That's a huge game for Billy. So, as I said, Lindy's and the opposing coach is a little more critical uh, of Billy Napier here. Well, uh, on the part, and I think this would open a lot of eyes, Billy is not a huge disciplinarian. And I do not think that means off the field. You know, off the field troubles have been pretty almost non-existent there. You know, player arrest, all that stuff, way down uh, under Billy Napier. You don't hear about those type of things. I do think this probably means all the penalties we've seen. You know, the inexcusable penalties we've seen under Billy Napier at Florida. Uh, you mentioned, you know, running players running onto the field, the miscommunication, all the special team errors we've seen. I do think that's the angle of whatever this opposing head coach in the SEC sees. Yeah, I, I think there's a difference between being a disciplinarian and being attentive to detail. Right. I, and I agree. It, you know, the, the guy, the guy. So if you remember, and I think there was actually a podcast that came out this week that was that had uh, Kelvin Taylor talking about Jim McElwain going nuts on him on the sideline. And, and you know, the reality is, is that if that's not you, if that's not who you are authentically, then it's not going to come off as, as authentic and the coach and the players aren't going to respect that. <laughs> so look, Billy Napier has to be Billy Napier. Now, the question is, 
is Billy Napier's attention to detail either transferring to the players or is he not attentive to detail? Those are sort of the questions that we have to be asking. And I think you're right when they talk about being a disciplinarian, they're talking about on the field, right? Do people um, like one of the plays that I would, that I would point to is the long touchdown. I think it was South Carolina against, uh, against Jason Marshall last year. No, it was Arkansas against Jason Marshall last year where he's going down the sideline and the guy got his face mask, right? But then there's not a whole bunch of effort on the back end after the guy makes the, after the guy makes the catch and you end up with a long touchdown, like those sorts of things are the things people point at and say, look, you got to be a little bit mean or they have to be scared of you. And, and I don't know that they necessarily need to be scared of you that you're going to come over and yell at them. They need to be scared. They're not going to get the playing time that they need. They, they need to be scared that all of a sudden a young guy is going to come and take their spot away. Those sorts of things like that fear or the, the, um, the drive that there's somebody coming up behind you who can take your spot is something that we haven't really seen at Florida. And I think they mentioned this with Muschamp, McElwain, and Mullen, right? That that those three guys, none of those guys really just went out there and said, that guy isn't doing his job, bring in the guy behind him. And I don't care if the guy behind him doesn't do his job either. We're not going to have somebody out there who doesn't do his job. Now, as far as the defensive side of things, you know, yes, I mean, Florida's defense needs to be better. But this is sort of, I think, fundamentally the thing that Florida fans are struggling with is you talk about Kirby Smart, he hangs his head on defense. You talk about Nick Saban, he hangs his head on defense. Where does Billy Napier hang his head? Mm. Like, what is the thing that Billy Napier brings that you go, this is a Billy Napier team? Well, it's supposed to be him as an offensive coordinator, play caller, as a head coach, right? Well, maybe, but if you look at his history, like, to me, that was never the value proposition. No, 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 but since he's that... I guess favoring that side of the ball. I mean, so and the offense hasn't been atrocious. No, I mean neither game, neither year has the offense been terrible. I think the the point I'm making is is that if you expected Billy Napier to be an offensive savant when he came in, <laughs> you've been severely <laughs> disappointed. But I don't think that's a reasonable expectation given what Billy Napier's teams did before. So to me, you look at the, the quote here where they're talking about Kirby Smart building a championship level defense first. Alabama built a championship level defense first under Saban. Well, to me, it's what. What's the championship level thing that Billy Napier needed to build? And to me, the championship level thing was the organizational excellence. It was all the stuff that sort of you're going, you know, in in the disciplinarian quote there above, Mm -hmm. like, how do you make sure special teams don't ever give up a yard or a point or an edge? How do you make sure that your offense is, is absolutely getting the absolute max it can get of it how do you protect the defense that maybe is a little bit undermanned? Like those sorts of things are the things that you, that, like you're going to have to do that at a championship level. So I start looking at scores in one score games. I start looking at um, beating teams you should beat where you have more talent than them. Um, those are the types of things you start looking at and saying, Billy Napier hasn't been able to do that yet. So I think it's unfair to question him in terms of, you know, Kirby built a championship level defense and, and Saban built a championship level defense. Yeah. Okay. Those guys are defensive guys. But then I think that go that then begs the question of, what is the thing that Billy Napier would have to build to a championship level to make us believe? And hopefully that's what we're going to see this year um, is we're going to start to see the marks of the championship level organization, the organizational excellence coming through, because if it doesn't, then there's nowhere to hang your hat. And if there's nowhere to hang your hat, then you might as well bring in somebody else who, who maybe will give you a place to hang your hat. And yeah, that's what I've meant by, you know, I don't care how hard the schedule is. If the thing is headed in the right direction, going to your point, if something is headed in a, if something is headed in a championship direction, we should know by year three. And then that should show itself even in a tough schedule. That's kind of just where, I, where I've been with it. Now, Gator Dave, playoff or bust. That's what he just said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so all that, look, we, what, what we've talked about kind of leading into this, where Florida's ranked, where Florida shouldn't be ranked. These anonymous head coaches' thoughts, all that leads to, well, hot seat talk. And look, I don't want to bring it up. It ain't me bringing it up. But of course, being at Florida, the first two seasons under Billy Napier, whether we want to believe it or not, or whether you want it to be the case or not, all this is going to lead to hot seat talk in these preseason magazines. You know, and this was tricky. You, You knew Napier would be on these lists no matter how safe his job may look on the inside from the administration. Uh, the, por- the performance so far is going to strike up the conversation whether we like it or not. I personally think that you know the admin will play it safe, um, to maybe to many people's dismay, and it will only take a mitigated disaster to fire Billy Napier. 
Uh, I do think a you know a six and six record is the the, the cutoff. I, I think it will get questionable, uh, but he's safe there. And if he survives, you know that anything worse than that, uh, I think all bets are off. Uh, any anything worse than six and six, all bets are off. I think anything better than that, I think we know he's safe. Uh, I, I I know many people close to the matter say he's safe no matter what, but I do think as losses mount up in real time. I think the narrative can shift. I think it's a lot easier to say you'll accept this than when you say it or when you see it and then try to accept it. So look, all that and the performance so far is why we see Napier on these lists. Uh, and if you look at Athlon, what they have to say about coaches on the hot seat, Billy Napier is one of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight coaches. He's one of eight coaches that they list on a hot seat. Napier inherited a roster in need of repair and a program that required plenty of behind-the-scenes work to get the Gators back to winning at a high level. However, patience is in short supply in the SEC. Kind of a narrative we've been hitting on. Although progress has been made in some areas, Florida is just 11-14 and 14 under Napier. The Gators are 6-10 and 10 in the SEC play over the last two years, have made some questionable in-game coaching decisions, were dominated by rival Georgia in back-to-back meetings, and finished 23 on a five-game losing streak. After some early optimism in recruiting, Florida's 24 signing class was hit with late decommitments and slid into 14th nationally, only adding to the building pressure on April going into the fall. Uh, and then Lindy's has seven coaches on the hot seat in 2024, and Napier is second on the list with his seat described as scorching behind Arkansas coach Sam Pittman. They go on to say, quote, Boosters need way more bang for their Gator bucks than two losing seasons in the quote. So um, there you go, Will. I mean, of course, these magazines every year have a hot seat section. It is no surprise because of the first two seasons, Billy Napier is on. Yeah, one of these days I'm going to go back and look and see how many of the hot seat guys actually wound up getting contract extensions at the end. Um, how far because... you want to go back? Because I got the magazine dropped behind me. I can do the research. <laughs> I can do the research right quick. Well, this is good. We'll we'll, we'll, we'll put that out as something later on this year. But um, look, I, I don't think anybody's surprised that Napier's on hot seat lists. We've been talking about it all off season, um, really, ever since the Florida State loss, and probably since the the loss against Arkansas. That 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 Napier was going to be in trouble this year or that Napier was going to have to deliver this year. And I don't think that's changed. You know, the, the thing about all the internal folks who may not make a change is the question is, are they going to be around? Right. I mean, that that's sort of been the, the discussion point is, you know, you don't get to hire three head coaches as a, as a athletic director most of the time. And so, you know, yeah, everybody's going to say all the right things until it's time to put people's heads on the chopping block. And then, and then changes will be made if the people who really make things move decide that it's time to make those sorts of changes. But I'm not really, I guess I look at it and I go, I look at it from an incentive structure perspective. Like Florida's accomplished a lot of the things that it wants to accomplish through the football program in terms of people who can, in terms of what their public profile is, in terms of the money that they bring in, all those sorts of things. I think Florida uniquely, because of how good a school it is, is actually able to show more patience than some of these other schools, like in Auburn, like in Alabama, maybe even if they struggle under Kalen DeBoer. Um, those sorts of schools use football as a way to juice admissions. Florida doesn't really have to do that anymore. So in some ways, it's interesting that the Urban Meyer era really sort of raised Florida's profile. Florida used that along with Billy Donovan and some other things to get to a point where now you're talking about a top five public institution. And so the incentive structure to just churn coaches every three years in hopes of sort of raising the profile of your program isn't necessary as much as it is at some other places. So I think that does breed a little bit more patience. I think it probably also breeds more frustration from the <laughs> fan base. But the frustration is is not what drives the decision making, right? And so um, – I think you're right. I mean, I think you look at it and six and six is sort of that cutoff. Again, I think if 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 they really struggle and Lagway comes in and is just, you know, throwing lasers all over the place, maybe you get away with a little bit worse record than that. If if Mertz plays lights out, okay, you go seven and five, but you know, you lose four straight to lose to end the year. Like, does that impact things? Maybe a little bit, but um, yeah. You know, well, I, another angle to this, we've had this discussion on Gators Breakdown Plus lately, Will is 
why now is it acceptable in year three to accept six and six, seven and five? Well, now, I mean, lot, to me, lot, it wasn't acceptable in year people, one. Right. A lot, of, yeah, a lot of people will point to the schedule and, and give that excuse. But, you know, why are we why are we moving the goalpost for, you know, this head coach when, you know, Ron Zook's following Steve Spurrier in a much better situation, gets fired after eight and eight or eight and five, eight and five, eight and five. Um, like we know the situation Billy Napier took over, you know, but you know, so six and sh- shouldn't you want more than six and six in year three? So it's actually a fundamental question that I think people are asking, which is that, are you better off? Do yeah. you know, after That's three years that a guy's not Nick Saban? And if your only goal as a program is to find Nick Saban or to find Kirby Smart or to find Dabo Swinney or to find, you know, Lincoln Riley or to find whoever that elite coach is. If that's your only goal and you can figure that out by year three, then you just churn until you find that guy. Because especially in college football, the way it's set up now with the transfer portal, and if you're not recruiting at a high level anyway, or at least an elite level, and I don't think any of us can argue that Billy Napier is recruiting at an elite level. If you're not recruiting at an elite level and with the way the transfer portal sits, the churn doesn't kill you as much as it used to. But fundamentally, I'll tell you the reason that I have any sort of hedge at all is because I'm like, I don't want to be the guy who runs Billy Napier out of town and then watches DJ Lagway lift the championship trophy with Ohio State fundamentally that's the thing that gives me pause because if DJ Lagway had flipped in December, I'd be like, guys, it's over like completely over. Like there's no possible way this program turns around. Now it's hard for me to, you know, I'm putting some expectations on a kid that are, that are pretty significant, but Billy Napier's done that to himself and done that to Lagway and Lagway made the decision to come here. And so that's sort of the way that sits. And if you compare it to Ron Zook and running him off quote unquote, after three years there, the difference is, is Chris Leak didn't have anywhere to go. And so Urban Meyer comes in and Le- Leak in today's day and age would have transferred yeah. anywhere else <laughs> rather than sit in that offense that Dan Mullen and Urban Meyer brought that they admit themselves he was a poor fit yeah. for, right? And now him sort of pushing through that and – and everybody having to stay because the transfer rules were different. In fact, Urban Meyer brought in transfers from from Utah to supplement the roster as opposed to guys leaving. So it was just a completely different era of college football. And I think when Will Muschamp was fired, it was a completely different era of college football. I think when Jim McElwain was fired, it was a completely different era of college football. And even I think you'd make the argument that when Dan Mullen was fired, it was a completely different era of college football. And so this era right now, Like the taste that Gator fans are going to have in their mouths. If DJ Lagway is hoisting a trophy someplace else, like the argument you're going to have, the risk management, you sit there and go like, you know, fear of missing out, all that sort of stuff. It's all that, you know, if, if I'm an administrator, if I'm a, if I'm a a booster, if I'm somebody like that, do I want to look and see him raise a trophy someplace else? Now you can make the argument that he's raising the trophy someplace else because he went to a place that's got a better program, a better coach and a better recruiting profile, all that sort of stuff. You can make that argument. But to me, that's the fear, right? The fear is, is that the best player that Billy Napier's recruited needs to have an opportunity to actually set foot on the field before we really evaluate whether Billy Napier is the right guy. Now, the fact that he's coming in in the third recruiting cycle is a problem in terms of how quickly things accelerate and how quickly we make these judgments. But, you know, that to me is the th- is the only reason that people are are hedging on where Florida needs to be because you're right, 6 and 6 in Gainesville, like 6 and 6 is mildly acceptable at South Carolina. Six and six is extension eligible at Vanderbilt. Six and six is we throw you out the door at Florida. That's sort of the way it's always been historically. And, uh, you know, I I don't know there will be a whole lot of patience um, with another six and six year from the fan base. But again, I go back to what are Florida's goals? What What are the administration's goals? What's the UAA's goals? And are those aligned with necessarily churning out 12 and 12 and one seasons. That's, that's an open question and something that I think we'll get an answer to at the end of the year, depending upon what the, what the results on the field look like. Good stuff. Will. Um, Hey, I'm going to end this episode with something that blew my mind Um, in a good way. Surprisingly right here. It's the four year standings. It's the last four years. 
Now, they, they throw Texas and Oklahoma in here, but they were in the Big 12, so I'm going to throw them out. So I'm still counting 14 teams that were in the SEC from 2020 to 2023. Those four seasons. Four year standings now, and this is the SEC record. You have Georgia 31 and 2, Alabama 31 and 3. Then you have to go all the way to 20 and 13. Ole Miss is the third ranked team with SEC wins. LSU 20 and 14. Will. Florida is next, <laughs> even with Dan Mullen's last terrible season, Billy Napier's first two seasons, of certainly it is propped up by that 2020 season. But in the last four years, Florida still ranks in the top five of SEC wins, and it's pretty much the same thing overall as well, believe it or not. Almost tied right there with Texas A&M. But, you know, you, you of course – we look at the, we look at it's a recency bias, and that's what we remember. Uh, but I would have never thought just because of the last three seasons. But what it tells me about the SEC is, besides Georgia and Alabama, there's a bunch of middling teams. <laughs> there are some in some years better than others. But the last four years, I mean, you have Ole Miss with 20 wins, LSU with 20 wins, Florida with 19 wins, Texas A&M with 18 wins. Tennessee and Missouri both with 17 wins. Kentucky with 15. I mean, there's a bunch of teams that are just really grouped together behind Georgia and Alabama in this four-year standings. Like, it, it, it wasn't something I was even really looking at. You know, I, I just glanced by it, and I say, well, oh, Florida's a lot higher than I really thought they would be in the SEC in the last four years. Yeah, I mean, it's – it. Honestly, it's exactly what you would guess if you looked at the recruiting rankings, because our, our old our old buddy Bill Sykes said this years ago, and I went and followed up on it and looked into it specifically, is that record for the top two teams in each conference is well above everybody else, and then it drops off, and it sort of go for the next six or seven teams, records sort of even out over time, and then you get to the bottom, the dregs of the conference, yeah. and it drops again, but. You know, I, I wrote a big article years ago looking at each conference, and it was the whole point was the SEC is not the ACC. And I think I even called it the almost competitive conference or something like that. I think that might have come from Bill. But, but, but you know, the, the whole point was is that Clemson and Florida State, people were saying, oh, Florida, just the next Clemson, you're recruiting at like 11th or 12th in the country. That'll be good enough. And it's like, yep. nah, because at no. 12th in the country, you're the sixth best team in the SEC or the fourth best team in the SEC. And there's a drop off after those top two. So it's exactly what I would have predicted looking at the recruiting rankings, which is both, uh, both, uh, um, I guess, rewarding from the standpoint of this stuff works, but also really discouraging because it tells you where Florida is at and what we should expect. And, and honestly, we spent a lot of time tonight talking about uh, Napier, what he needs to do, all that sort of stuff uh, in order to survive. And, and I think um, one of the things that shouldn't be lost on that is the variability that you see season to season. Like how many times do you see a team put up a 10 and three season after they've had a bad year? And then all of a sudden that coach gets an extension and the next year they're terrible again. Yeah. Right. And so that is something that Florida, the administration, fans, everybody needs to guide against. A 10 and three season this year would be spectacular. It would be a lot of fun and we would have a great time watching it. But I don't know that that necessarily says Florida has everything fixed and Napier has everything fixed. I think people will treat yeah. it that way. But I think it also might just be the kicker made a kick and you you wound up 4-0 in one-score games. And, you know, you didn't kick yourself in the, in the nuts when you were going for a game-winning for a game winning drive or something like Florida has in the past. Now, look, that would be an improvement. But at the same time, I think you got to be really wary of the variation that you get. And like you said, I mean, even as bad as the last three years have been, Florida still, what, what was it, fifth in the yeah. SEC and wins? Georgia, Georgia, Alabama, Ole Miss, LSU, Florida. Yeah, but I, but I would also be willing to venture that the distance in wins between Georgia and Florida is about the same distance between Florida and maybe like Mississippi State. Uh, Georgia 31, Florida 19. So All right. 12. 12. And then so he's got seven. Florida with 19, uh, Mississippi State 12. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's what I'm saying. 
Arkansas has 11. You have to go all the way to Vanderbilt at two. <laughs> and I thought Clark Lee was going to be a good hire. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was doing some thing, different things, but uh, yeah. Did turns different out, things. It turns out Vanderbilt turns is out a place to win. Yeah. <laughs> That's James Franklin. Um, yeah, except for him, for sure. But, well, I mean, the kicker here, um, Florida has won just 17 of 41 games since December 6th, 2020. Yeah, it's been kind of a miserable time to cover Florida. I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll say that. I always have this conversation on the Gators Breakdown Plus the other day. It was just like, man, since I've started this podcast, just haven't been. It's not my fault, believe me, but I mean, <laughs> haven't been able to cover that many good seasons. Well, that's the best part is when people come at us for like being negative, and it's like you know this would be a whole lot easier, and people would like we would have a lot more fun if we were covering a team that was winning national championships. Yeah. Like, that's what we root for yeah. for two reasons. One is when they're winning, the numbers are spectacular. Exactly. And the other part is, is when they're winning, it's actually fun to cover yes. all that sort of stuff. But I also say this all the time is that, is that I think, and we're going to see this in the next couple of years, um, likely because it's really difficult to follow a legend. I think Alabama fans got to a point where they took for granted what Nick Saban was able to do. And I think they probably tried very hard not to, but it's hard not to, right? It's hard to sit there and go, look, it's playoff or bust every year. Yeah. That's what it is. Saban set those expectations. I think Georgia fans are getting there with Kirby in some respects. Um, and so the the joy for Georgia, I'm sure, was climbing that mountain and getting the win. And now it's sort of this, we have to maintain it and everybody's coming at you and 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 that sort of stuff. I think it's interesting that the climb is sometimes the thing that makes you appreciate when you finally get to the peak. And so you and I are going to appreciate when hopefully in 2026, we're sitting here after a New Year's Day bowl game where Florida's just like kicked a game-winning field goal in the national championship. Well, I guess it'd be a week after New Year's. But Florida's kicked a game-winning field goal in the Even national championship. Even further than that with this 12-team playoff. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But you and I are sitting here doing a a post game a post game analysis of a national championship and no one would be happier than us but but i think the reason we would be happy is the dues that that we and the fan base and the program have had to pay to get there yeah and it's interesting for years i mean you know you got the spurrier era where everything was was really really good for a really long period of time and then you got the Zook sort of, you know, it wasn't terrible, but for what Spurrier had built, it was down. And then you bring in Meyer and all of a sudden you're back up to those heights. And the expectation is that's just where we are. That's where we will always be like, yeah, we might have a bad coach every once in a while. I'll be down for a couple of years, but we'll find the guy. We'll pay for it. We'll end up right where we need to be. And it turns out finding Urban Meyer and finding Steve Spurrier is really difficult. And when Florida finds that guy, it's going to be glorious. Hopefully that's Billy Napier, but thus far, I don't have a lot of confidence that that's the case. <laughs> and so, you know, these are just the dues you have to pay to get there. And, and unfortunately, sometimes it means you've got some six and seven and five and seven seasons along the way. Um, you know, I can remember when I was a kid watching, I remember specifically watching um, Tennessee, Georgia in a hotel room. And it was Peyton Manning on one side, I think Eric Zire on the other for Georgia. And like, you know, they were sitting there going, Eric Zire, he's the brand new hope here at Georgia. And nah, it was another, what, 25 years before Georgia was able to yeah. get to the top. Hopefully that's not what we have. Hopefully it's not that kind of, that kind of thing, but you know, I David, can envision a David scenario Green, where can, Quincy, Quincy Carter, David Green, I mean, they were supposed to have all these quarterbacks and coaches that were, yeah, there's going to be some kid talking talking about, you remember when I watched Graham Mertz and they thought he was going to be a guy who could lead him to a championship? And, you know, look, I hope I'm wrong, but uh, but uh, that's part of what makes this fun, right? If we knew what was going to happen, if there weren't surprises, if there wasn't the build, then why would we care? And and so it, the the only thing I can think of through sort of these lean years is embrace the climb. Yeah. Because when you get there, then it'll be awesome and we'll all be able to share it with each other. Right now we're just, you know, going around before we climb. <laughs> it's going around yeah. the mountain. It's going around the mountain. Got to got to make sure you got the supplies so you don't die when you get up to the top of the mountain. <laughs> there we go. That's what there we're we doing. Go. We're just we're just preparing. It's Collecting like supplies. Preparing. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, another look at pieces of magazine. As I said, uh, this kind of a wide scope look here. There's a lot more personnel things we'll get into uh, as we uh, kind of. We're counting down to SEC media days in a couple of weeks. I mean, it's pretty much, uh, you know, once the calendar hits July, you know, it, it hits kind of pull 
full preview uh, season, getting ready for SEC Media Days, and camp will be starting at the end of the month. So, uh, hey, it's 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 almost here. Dude, my wife looked at me the other day and it's like, you've only got two months till the season starts. And I'm like, wow, you're right. I can't <laughs> yeah. see too much yeah. till the season starts. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, my favorite time of year, buddy. We're, we're getting there real quick. All right. We'll be right here on Gators Breakdown, breaking it all down, previewing it for you right here. For Will Miles, readreaction.com, read reaction on YouTube. I am David Waters, host of Gators Breakdown. You can find me on social media at GatorDave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thank you for joining us on this episode of Gators Breakdown.